Jeff and I have known each other for a very long time, and then we got to know each other better in the middle of last year when I wrote a profile of him in Fortune. So I'm very familiar with LinkedIn and with his ideas about being a, a CEO and a leader and a manager, and I think we can discuss some of that this yep. morning. The I don't know which came first, the idea to do a topic on uh, the subject, uh, to do a discussion on the, the topic of purpose, or to invite you to talk about it, because this is something I assume you were passionate about before, I know that you were passionate about, I don't know when the idea to do a whole session on it was, so I'm going to start with just that. If you would tell everybody what your concept of purpose is with regard to the business world, a corporation, making money, and so on. I hadn't heard that in the context of um, uh, differentiating between the business world and, and making money. For me, personally, purpose starts with the, what I hope to accomplish in the world and uh, the impact that I can hopefully have in the world. And, uh, you know, from a very young age, I've been fortunate insofar as having a sense of what it was that I wanted to do. Uh, when I was in high school, I always felt like there was a way of doing things differently in terms of education, uh, greater emphasis on experiential learning as an example. And uh, you know, looking back on it now, it, it's almost, I'm almost ashamed uh, given the experience I was afforded in uh, you know, a suburb of uh, Westchester County. And you, know, you, you think about uh, where the state of education is today, and uh, I remember seeing the documentary uh, waiting for Superman, and uh, the fact that there are uh, really deserving kids who have to win a lottery, literally win a lottery, in terms of getting into the school uh, of, their, of their choice. Uh, you know, I had it much better than that, but at any rate, uh, when I was as young as 16, 17, decided that uh, the impact I wanted to have on the world was somehow helping to reform the education system. Oh, excuse me, I think it's falling out a little bit. And when I was applying to university, uh, was uh, faced by a decision, was I going to pursue uh, a public sector role where I was teaching, administrating, or potentially legislating, or a private sector role where I could potentially amass enough influence and resources where I could make a difference that way. And so from that very early age, it's always been about uh, the, the role that I could play in helping to make a positive difference. And that's evolved over time. Education has always really been at the foundation of that, and the, the idea of democratizing access to information uh, and then ultimately uh, creating opportunities for people, economic opportunities for people. And what I've come to learn now that I'm at LinkedIn is, you know, creating uh, a good education and uh, the right environment for education is only one part of the equation. If there's not economic opportunity, it's incomplete. So it's interesting the way things have turned out. I I'm also very much a believer that ultimately uh, your career path uh, should be something directed by understanding what it is that you want to do, what you want to accomplish. And a quick exercise I'll play, uh, typically with younger folks, uh, students or interns, uh, people just starting out in their career who are asking for career advice is, you know, what, what can they do to be successful? And it starts with a simple question, you know, you look out 20 or 30 years from now, what do you want to say you accomplished? And uh, amazingly to me, uh, even at this point, uh, the number of people who are 5, 10, 15 years uh, into their career who don't know the answer to that question because they got swept up into the stream of opportunity. Uh, they got a job offer, they got a few promotions, they got recruited by a really hot company. And so to me, this notion of purpose and what it is that you want to accomplish is, uh, it's impossible to draw any kind of distinction between that, a career, a business, uh, making money, et cetera. Oops. So I, Jeff, I want to eventually, or soon, I want to drive the, co the conversation toward how you take the things you just talked about personally and instill that sense of purpose in an entire corporation, in, in all of LinkedIn. I want to I want to pause though and, and and play devil's advocate with you on something. I'm gonna I'm gonna be sort of so unusual. Adam, yeah, I know, I know. Never plays I'm gonna, devil's advocate. I'm gonna exaggerate the point to make the point. Okay. So you so you 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 you'll, you and everyone else will know that. But let's. Um, Let's, let's posit that um, revolutionizing the resume and putting the resume online is a very good thing for education. It helps educate people in their careers. It helps, edu it helps people promote their careers, et cetera. But it isn't saving lives. It's not saving cancer. It's not serving in the Peace Corps. It's not you know, any number of things that we might say, if you really want to make the world a better place, you could do 
X, Y, Z, and a very long list of things before joining a very successful company that, you know, makes the inf makes a, provides a little bit better information than existed 10 years ago. I actually think, and I may be biased, our, our vision statement at LinkedIn, we draw a distinction between vision and mission, where the vision is a dream, it's true north, it's what inspires us to come to work every day, and the mission is an overarching objective that's measurable, realizable, and hopefully inspirational. Our vision, our dream, is to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. And that begins with uh, representing your professional identity to the world. Uh, your experiences, your skills, perhaps most importantly, your ambitions, increasingly the knowledge that you possess. And so I appreciate the fact that Adam's playing devil's advocate because I, I know he believes in what we're trying to accomplish, but he uh, listed off a few examples of uh, objectives that uh, some might deem uh, more worthy or more valuable uh, than creating economic opportunity for people, and I would counter that creating economic opportunity is at the heart of every single thing he just listed. There is nothing, in my opinion, that's more profoundly important to the world than creating economic opportunity. The reason being, economic opportunity enables people to feel as if they have a chance and to feel as if they have a voice. And when people don't feel like they're being heard, it's an existential crisis on a metaphysical level. Uh, it's at the, the heart of existence is being heard. And so economic opportunity is a physical manifestation of being heard. It's having a say. It's being able to be productive. It's being able to contribute to society. And if you deny people the opportunity to do that, very, very bad things happen. The flip side is that once you create those opportunities for people, amazing stuff can happen. So uh, at least at LinkedIn, we believe there's nothing more important. And you're, the next step or the, ne the next logical step in the argument b becomes that LinkedIn is critical to that process. If, if you're successful, LinkedIn is integral to cr helping create economic choice. And so I'm asking if that's a, if that's a fair leap, because I might argue, you know, there, there could be any number of companies that would create economic opportunity, mm. maybe far better than LinkedIn, but maybe you would, that wouldn't be your perspective. Uh, perhaps, and you know what, if they can, more power to them and more power to all of us because this is a collective thing and uh, the more economic opportunity there is in the world, uh, the more the world benefits. So uh, if LinkedIn can be a change agent to that effect, that's wonderful. Uh, we certainly uh, don't need to exclusively own this notion of creating economic opportunity for people. In terms of the role we play specifically with regard to creating economic opportunity, you cited you know, the notion of a resume or your professional identity. That, that's really only the first step. Uh, to getting started on LinkedIn. Ultimately, it's about representing your, your experiences, your objectives professionally. Sorry, this mic keeps coming off. Yeah. And connecting with other people. Uh, connecting with... I think it's on better than you, better than you think. Okay. It's just flimsy. Right. You know. Can we have a handheld if you prefer, Jeff? Co connect, yeah. Let's go with that. Thank you. Uh, can I, I'm going to shut this off. Uh, connecting with companies, connecting with higher education organizations, connecting with the news information, knowledge, and skills that you need to ultimately realize the opportunities that are interesting to you. And thus far to date, uh, we have largely been about connecting people to people. So in a sense, we're a professional graph, where a graph is just a, a digital rendering or mapping of various nodes or connections. And uh, at the most recent uh, quarter, we, we announced we had 347 million members. There's roughly 780 million knowledge workers or professionals in the world when you include students. There are over 3 billion people in the global workforce. So our mission to connect the world's professionals, make them more productive and successful, is about that 780 million number. Jeff, I'm sorry, did you say that again more slowly, the mission that, you know, hit every note, because I sure. want people to hear that. So the mission of LinkedIn is to connect the world's professionals to make them more productive and successful. That's that overarching objective that we measure ourselves against. We're 347 million members today. There's roughly 780 million knowledge workers or students in the world. That's the immediate addressable opportunity. The dream, the vision, is to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce, all 3 billion plus people. And we're in this really unique position. I've never had a chance to do this professionally before, and Matt and Connie can tell you all about this, where we can operationalize our vision statement. So when you say there are other companies that are in a position where they can do this and what uh, enables us to do it differently or at a different level of scale, it's because ultimately the operationalization of the vision is going to lead to us doing something that's never really been imagined before, let alone executed on, 
which is we're in a position by virtue of today's technology where we can digitally map the global economy. Whereas, you know, uh, historically we've been about mapping professional relationships in the future, we're going to extend that professional graph not to be limited to knowledge workers, but all three billion plus people in the global workforce. So that's one. So a digital profile for every member of the global workforce, three billion plus people. Two is a profile for every company in the world. It's roughly 60 to 70 million companies in the world when you include small and medium sized businesses. Three is a digital representation <clears throat> of every job made possible by those companies. Full-time, part-time, for-profit, volunteer. Four is we're going to digitally represent every skill required to obtain one of those opportunities. Five, we're going to create a presence, a digital presence for every university or higher educational organization that enables those individuals to acquire the skills they need to realize the opportunities. And then six, we're going to make it easy for every individual, every company, and every university to share their professionally relevant knowledge if they'd like to. And then we're going to take a step back and we're going to allow capital, all forms of capital, intellectual capital, working capital, of course, human capital, to flow to where it can best be leveraged. And in doing so, the hope is we can help lift and transform the global economy. That's something we believe we are uniquely positioned to do by virtue of the time we live in, the infrastructure that we've built out, the critical mass that we have today, and the value that we've been able to create. Jeff, we'll take about a, mo about a minute or two and remind everybody the three ways that LinkedIn makes money today. So uh, three different uh, business lines, talent solutions, marketing solutions, and sales solutions. So talent solutions was initially about recruiting and a very specific kind of recruiting called passive candidate recruiting, whereas historically, uh, when a company would post a job, uh, they'd get a bunch of active candidates, people actively seeking work, would bombard uh, that recruiter uh, with their resume. And so the recruiter spent the lion's share of their time saying no and filtering out uh, potential applications. Uh, passive candidate recruiting is what headhunters traditionally did, where you might receive a phone call every now and again, and uh, the recruiter would say, hi, are you interested in the following opportunity? And then you'd give an answer, and you'd hear something like, because they were typing the response into their database. And they'd say, well, if you're not interested, do you know three names of people that would be interested? And that doesn't scale, and more importantly, it goes out of date within a, the span of a few months. And that's the way passive candidate recruiting worked historically. And it was very effective, but no scale whatsoever, and very, very expensive. The existence of LinkedIn completely revolutionized that business because people updated their profiles on LinkedIn. They connected with other people when they weren't actively looking for work. And now all of a sudden you've got this huge repository of information about professionals that recruiters can use to find exactly the right candidate. So that charge, you charge recruiters money for access to that information. Yeah, so that was the first business line. That's done really well for us. And uh, that was our first billion dollar business. And uh, we're still just getting started there. Each year we look at our addressable opportunity and each year it gets bigger. Uh, the second is marketing solutions. So all of the activity taking place on LinkedIn, our understanding of who you are, what you're trying to accomplish, all of the engagement uh, being generated, uh, generates an opportunity for marketers to be able to reach out to you in a targeted way and ideally a relevant way so they can get the right products and services in front of you such that you can be better at your job, you can be more successful, more productive. Uh, so a decision maker overseeing an ERP solution uh, has an opportunity to learn more about the next generation ERP solution. And uh, that business has been going well for us. As a matter of fact, for all the discussion historically about LinkedIn's focus on talent solutions and recruiting, the fastest growing business in the company's history uh, is sponsored updates. It's native advertising. It's uh, companies promoting specific content in our feed. And so we're very excited about where that business is going. And then third is the newest business, which is sales solutions. So sales solutions can do for salespeople what talent solutions did for recruiters. So historically, a salesperson uh, would comb whatever resources they could get their hands on to identify a prospect at a company they want to reach. And then they would cold call that individual, regardless of whether or not they knew the individual, and regardless of whether or not the individual was interested. And there was a, a dance that was done, and it, not very effective. <clears throat> And so now, uh, through LinkedIn, uh, we believe the era of social selling is now here, where these salespeople can establish their identity, so you know who you're dealing with. They can identify exactly the right person within an organization they need to reach. They can identify the best way to connect with that person and get uh, an introduction through a, a mutual relationship to convert the cold call to the warm prospect. And they can learn about you so they can engage with you in a more meaningful, productive way. 
And so we think we have the potential to revolutionize the sales industry the way we've done for the recruiting industry. And that's a subscription business for salespeople the way your recruiting business is a subscription business for recruiters? Yes. If I did my math correctly, you're suggesting you, you think you've got about a tenth of the workers of the world uh, who are users of LinkedIn right now, right? A little more than that, yep. Um, give us, explain in the future how, how specifically you see, I'll just, I'll just use an archetype, a, a ditch digger in a village in India having a digital presence on LinkedIn. So ultimately, that's probably going to be a mobile device. It's going to be potentially different than the way we're you know, using mobile devices today, where it could uh, largely be text-oriented. Uh, the device may not be a smart device just yet, although with the progression of technology and scale, prices may come down to such an extent. I think that's the hope, certainly, that everyone in the world will be able to afford the same smart uh, phones that we're using. But at any rate, uh, you're already seeing ditch diggers or farmers uh, leveraging phones. Uh, to access information that enables them to be more successful, more productive. Uh, you hear these stories about farmers who are understanding weather patterns in a way that was just completely unfathomable in the developing world. This is like real developing world. And so there's nothing to prevent them from being able to connect to that economic graph we were describing earlier. And you know, there were some concerns when we originally started talking about the vision and the scale. Isn't that going to massively dilute your core audience? You've got high value white collar professionals and now all of a sudden you're going to be introducing farmers and villages in Africa. And that's the beauty of a network. You all decide who you're connected to. You all decide who you're following. You all decide what opportunities you're interested in. And if you want to be connected, to a farmer in a village in Africa, there, and there's a whole slew of reasons why that might make sense for you, then you can. And if you don't want to be, then you won't be. And beyond the traditional connection, which is a more symmetrical relationship, uh, we've also added the ability to follow people and follow companies and follow organizations, which doesn't have the same social cost doing this, like Joey Tribbiani and Friends. Remember that episode where he was doing air quotes the whole time? <laughs> so, uh, you, you have the ability to follow somebody. So, uh, part of the challenge is that that farmer may have uh, far more need to be connected to you than you do the farmer. And that's certainly the case even within the professional realm of CEOs who are being bombarded by people who ultimately want to be like the CEO. And so we created a mechanism through which you can follow them. And so, someone like Richard Branson, I think, is well north of six million followers on LinkedIn now. Is it seven million? We may be approaching seven million. And so rather than accept all these invitation requests, you can just follow him. And so when he feels like sharing what it takes to be a great entrepreneur, uh, you benefit from all of his experience and wisdom. And so I think that model will enable us to scale down this path in a way that's going to be uh, uh, higher quality in terms of relevancy. Uh, Google and Facebook in particular have gotten a lot of publicity of late because they're, they believe it's important, I, I, I think, both for their businesses and for the, the good of society that everybody in the world be connected to, to the Internet. Clearly, you think so too, both personally and, and it will be good for LinkedIn when that happens. They're putting a significant amount of capital behind those ambitions. Uh, will LinkedIn do, do something similar? I, I don't know that that's going to be necessary, nor do I know that that's the best deployment of our capital. I mean, you have companies like Facebook and like Google doing exactly what you just said, which is building out the infrastructure to connect every human being on the face of the planet digitally. And we want to be a part of that stack. We don't think we need to build out the infrastructural layer, and we certainly don't need to duplicate uh, their efforts. We want to invest in the economic graph, which is, uh, you know, it's a platform, and it, it would be an application on top of their stack, but we think it's a platform in and of itself. So I'm sure you see where I'm going with this. You're, you're going to, I don't know the right way to ask the question, but you have a very happy situation here. If they're successful, you're going to freeload on, on, on their efforts. As you, as you freeload... I, I haven't quite thought about it in those terms. A, as you freeload on the significant capital that goes into the development of the Internet around the world is, is you know, is that, that's just a good thing, right? Yeah, I, I, I mean, genuinely, I don't think of it as freeloading per se. I think of us as adding a lot of value on that stack. And you could say the same thing of anyone on that stack going all the way back to the DARPA days when the infrastructure was first built out. So any company that is building infrastructure out on the Internet, whether it's Facebook, Google, or any telco company, is, in your parlance, freeloading on top of that initial infrastructure that the government built out. It's not, I don't see it as freeloading. I think uh, all of these companies, in some way, hopefully, are creating economic value. Um, Jeff, tell everyone about LinkedIn for good. 
So LinkedIn for Good is an employee-led and funded foundation so that uh, we are in a position where we can leverage our platform, where we can leverage our talent, where we can leverage our resources, our time and energy and capital uh, to have an impact uh, on volunteer organizations, NGOs, nonprofits, uh, groups of people that need help, uh, the unemployed, long-term unemployed, uh, veterans, and uh, that is being led today uh, by an incredibly talented woman named Meg Garlinghouse, who I had the pleasure of working with when we were both at Yahoo. And she led Yahoo's community efforts, and that was one of the earliest hires I made when I joined LinkedIn. And uh, you know, it's something that Reed, the founder, Reed Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, and I believe in very deeply, is uh, this notion of not giving back per se, but just having a positive impact on the world. And that doesn't always have to happen through profit generation. Um, before we go to, to q and I want to uh I want to bring us back to this concept of the corporation as a, as a force for good. Mm. And the corporation... Not a, not a popular belief these days. Well, right, yeah. And I, and I want, and so I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. And here's the way I want to, I want to frame it. Because I, I, I think you, I know you believe that. And, and I'd like to hear you articulate, you know, why... Let's start there. Why and how can the corporation be a force for good? Uh, you know, we can get more deeply into corporations, especially within the context of today's discussion, but it, it's really about first human beings as individuals, and then in groups of people, and then organizations, of which corporations are one category. And individuals who are interested in doing good uh, will probably, uh, not probably, they will have more success when connected with other people of like mind. There are scale benefits. And so regardless of uh, who the individuals are, if they have a shared objective and they are willing to put the time and the energy into their objectives, they have the right leadership, they have the right resources, uh, there's nothing to prevent them from realizing their objective. And so you can do that as an individual. I think you get better scale benefits doing it as a team. Uh, you bring teams together and that's an organization. Companies have a fairly well-developed mechanism of organization at scale. And so I think companies are in a position where if the leadership of those companies and the employees that comprise those companies are interested in having a positive impact, then there's nothing to prevent a company from having a positive impact. The challenge is ensuring that the leadership is interested in having a positive impact, that they're not just saying it. There's one thing, talking to talk. It's another thing, walking the walk. That the narrative of that company, uh, we call it from vision to values, vision, mission, value proposition, your target audience and the people you're trying to reach, your strategy and the way in which you navigate a competitive landscape, your objectives, priorities, your culture and your values are all aligned with the impact you want to have in the world. Once that narrative is established, it has to be reinforced at every term. It has to be authentically believed and held and then constantly manifested. Recruiting, onboarding, development, performance evaluations. And it needs to become a, a, a deeply held set of beliefs and ethos. It needs to become the fabric of the company. And if everyone's aligned around trying to have a positive impact, that's what's going to happen. And keep going with where you started with, which is why do you, th why did you say that you know this notion of of, the, of a corporation as a force for good is is not a popular notion, not a widely held yeah. notion? Why? Uh, it's it's the unfortunate truth is that from time to time there are companies who are not necessarily trying to have a positive impact on the world. They're trying to maximize profit regardless, uh, or they're trying to maximize uh, their own profit as opposed to the company's profit. And so sometimes companies go off the rails. And uh, an old friend of mine once said, trust equals consistency over time. Very simple formula for a very complex human dynamic. And there's no substitute for either of those things, consistency or time. So you telling someone to trust you has 0% chance of working. <laughs> Even if you're a good person, they're a good person, it, it's not the way trust works. So anytime you have a company that is eroding trust with their customers, with investors, with the press, with the public at large, with governments, it creates inconsistency. And it makes it that much harder for every other company to say, no, 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 we're trying to do the right thing. And it's perfectly understandable, it's human nature. I mean, we do that to protect ourselves. So the, the unfortunate truth is there are companies from time to time that are not aligned around doing the right thing, which means the onus is on all of us who are trying to do the right thing uh, to do it to the best of our ability and to just stick to it and to not be dissuaded by all the skepticism 
because there's a lot of skepticism. And if you allow it to, it will, it will run you down. And so you band together with other people who believe as deeply in what you're trying to accomplish as you do. And you just kind of pick each other up and keep going. Sometimes, but because companies have to make profits, especially publicly traded companies, sometimes companies have to be tough. They have to try to beat the competition. The executives have to fire workers who aren't performing up to speed. They have to recruit people from, from, from other companies and, you know, companies that they either compete against or maybe only compete against tang tangentially. In other words, corporations have to, be, have to be tough and maybe even nasty to win. Do you agree? I think they need to be competitive to win. I think winning is in the eye of the beholder. So you talk about an organization's mission. And uh, this is going to start to uh, get into some pretty philosophical territory. So if we you guys, there, right? if we're, you guys want to bring it back on philosophy at, at any time, just let us know. But there's a lot of humanities majors in the, uh, in, in the audience. So if you think about it, this is not rationalization. And this is a construct. And everyone can decide for themselves where they sit along this, uh, this construct. An organization has a mission. So in LinkedIn's case, to connect the world's professionals, make them more productive and successful. Are we winning? if some other company manifests that mission? Not rhetorical, interactive. I would say yes would be my guess. I, I think I hear a bunch of yes. Very good. There's a bunch of people out there who would say absolutely not. That's got to be LinkedIn winning. LinkedIn has to win. LinkedIn has to manifest the mission. So you know, there's no right or wrong. It's just a, a different opinion. So when you said you have to be nasty, do you have to be ultra competitive, do you have to you know, go into those gray areas? Well, it depends on how you define winning. If other companies are able, this is, goes back to the economic graph. You know, uh, the economic graph is for all of us to benefit from. And I think one of the ways we'll be more likely to manifest that vision is by creating shareholder value. So we have the capital to deploy so we can continue to realize that's, that set of objectives. So that's, uh, you know, I, I think that it is possible to win uh, and not necessarily have to tread into those gray areas or those dark areas. I do think if you want to be competitive, it's going to require trade-offs. And this is not a black and white discussion, in particular because your competition may not ad adhere to the same culture and values that you do. Hmm. And then you are in a really interesting position. And that's why it's so important to codify that stuff and make sure you're all aligned in terms of what you're trying to do and what kind of trade-offs you're willing to make. And uh, that's the hardest part of being in business, in my opinion. And that, I just, that and changing culture. Yeah, and I just wanted to give you an opportunity to, to dwell on something to make sure all of you heard what Jeff said because codifying these things was very important to you from an early stage at, at LinkedIn. And I think, I assume that some young companies skip through the writing down phase because they're too busy. Uh, yes, I think that is a very safe assumption. I think a lot of big companies big skip company, the writing yeah. down phase. Uh, yeah, yeah. I will not mention the company. It is a company that you may not even think of as a company. It is a company. It's a company that we have all engaged with. We love what they do. Uh, it it's, uh, plays a, a very fun, kind of exciting part of society, not necessarily technology. And um, uh, we were talking the other day, and uh, we, we got on the importance of narrative. Uh, this is a subject we have not uh, covered yet, but uh, the importance of a, a corporate narrative and how you communicate that uh, is not just about building trust. It's increasingly about building your brand, both your corporate brand and your talent brand, which, in my opinion, have now converged. And that wasn't always the case prior to social media. And so we were talking about vision of values, and we were talking about how we define those things. And I just assumed. Uh, that this company's uh, leadership had done the same. And they were very candid with us and said, uh, I have no idea where to even find that mission statement. It's probably in a, in a drawer somewhere collecting dust. And so you'd be amazed how many organizations do not take the time to codify what they're about. Uh, that was very important to me by virtue of some previous experiences I had at other companies where it was not always clear what we were trying to accomplish. And had it been clear at one point, things evolved to such an extent where it needed to be revisited. And that becomes very, very difficult for a company that has gone all in on one set of objectives and created a lot of value. And the idea that you would then uh, veer from that 
at the expense of immediate term value creation, but knowing that if you don't do it, uh, you're not going to be able to maximize long-term value. That's really, really hard to do. So, uh, you know, I, there's a, a few moments I can think of. I'm not sure if Adam had any of these in mind when he, when he brought this up, but there's a, a few uh, very important moments in my life that all led to uh, the importance of codification. One was that professional experience, another was a discussion uh, we had with, uh, my team had, I invited Deepak Chopra, who's a, a friend, and someone I have a lot of respect for, a brilliant guy, uh, and in a lot of different areas. And invited him to come in to uh, talk to my executive team while I was at Yahoo. And we were talking about um, what kind of role Yahoo could have in the world uh, as a platform that reached 500 million, at the time, 500 million people a month. This is years and years ago. And he said, well, we are the stories that we tell. And right now, there's a lot of anxiety in the world, and there's a lot of negative energy and a lot of darkness, because those are the stories that are being told. They, they appeal to the, the shadow that lies within all of us. And uh, one of the things that a platform reaching so many people can do is shine a light on the other stories, the more positive stories. Not in some Pollyanna way, but just to make sure that there's more harmony and balance. And, and that was important. So the line I took from that is that we are the stories that we tell. That's true as individuals, and that's true as companies who are comprised of individuals. And so that narrative, this notion of vision to values, that's really a company's story. That's what a company's all about. So professional experience, this notion of we are the stories that we tell, and then just to round it out, uh, David Gergen, uh, he's now, I think, an analyst for CNN. He was a communications director in at least four different White House administrations, both Democrats and Republicans, which speaks to his ability a uh, brilliant communicator, wrote a book on communications, and in the book talked about the fact that every effective leader throughout history understood the importance of repetition. Because when you're trying to get a point across, especially to a large audience or constituency, you need to repeat it over and over again. And uh, a colleague of mine once characterized that, having read the book, as saying, in order to get your message through, to, especially to a large audience, you need to repeat yourself so often you get sick of hearing yourself say it, and only then will people begin to internalize it. And when he first said it, I thought he was saying it almost tongue-in-cheek, but it, there's nothing tongue-in-cheek about it at all. It's one of my first rules for effective communication is the importance of repetition. And as a senior leader, as you guys continue to evolve in your career and you're, you're responsible for more and more things and more and more people, you will recognize the importance of repetition. And it will never cease to blow your mind how many times you need to say something before it starts to sink in with very talented, capable, dedicated people. The reason being, they're not in your head. <laughs> and we are all egocentric. We're not all egomaniacal. We're all egocentric. We see the world through our own lens. So those are some thoughts on codification. Your questions. Who has the first question? Right, right up here, please. Um, Tom Donaldson, uh, Wharton School. And, uh, Here's a mic for you. Yep. Yeah, Tom Donaldson, uh, Wharton School. It's, it's seldom that somebody accuses uh, somebody from Wharton, you, um, of being overly humble. But I, I think there's a sense in which when you talk about the vision uh, and, and use language like economic opportunity, as true as that is, it sells short to some extent my sense of what LinkedIn does. And I, I just wanted to get your, your reaction to it. It seems to me that in addition to economic impact, which as the question revealed, almost any other company can claim to achieve, LinkedIn does something very special. It, it creates an opportunity for people who deserve to be known, who wouldn't have been known in another era or in another context without LinkedIn to be known. With LinkedIn, the old boys network is not as powerful. With LinkedIn, uh, if I happen to be in a geographic area where uh, it's, it's very hard to get my, my talents seen, uh, LinkedIn helps me do that. So I, did, I mean, it's, it's not a huge point, but, but isn't that part of what gets you up and gets people up at LinkedIn and, and moving? Very much so. So when we talk about economic opportunity, it's interesting. Uh, like most things, uh, words have power, and uh, there's a lot of Rorschach tests that go on. So when I say economic opportunity, it means one thing to me. It may mean something different to you. And you may hear the economic and think the economy and think about this construct. And uh, at the company, 
Uh, the way we think about it is different. It, it's that, but it's also the impact we're having on every member of the platform. The 347 million people, eventually the 780 million people, and hopefully, ultimately, the 3 billion plus people. And it's exactly the impact that you so eloquently just described. I mean, I could go on and on and on with the emails I get from members whose lives have been changed. Uh, the veteran who came back, who had no idea how they were going to find work, in part because very tactically, uh, the skills and the standardized skills database that's used in the military doesn't match the standardized skills databases that we use in civilian life. And so the role we could play there. Or, um, I want to, Jeff, I want to get to, we have a lot more questions. Oh, sorry. So at any rate, couldn't agree more. And thank you for saying it. <laughs> Go ahead. Yep. Oh, right here. Yep. David Langstaff, first, thank you for being here. I've been CEO of a number of public and private companies and director, and I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts on uh, how, as you globalize, some of the ethical issues as you get into countries that have different values, um, issues of censorship, I know you've gone into China, um, and also cons whether you concern yourself too much about how, w how those who, who, who don't share your vision and values might use your infrastructure, your services, your offerings for ill, for bad. Is that something which you worry about or is that really not, 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 not your concern? Well, it's most definitely our concern. It's a platform that we're responsible for. So people using it for nefarious intention is something that we need to make sure isn't happening to the best of our ability. So it's very, very important. In terms of certain business opportunities or situations not necessarily aligning with our culture and values, uh, this is something we were touching on earlier in the discussion. And it's really difficult. And there's no uh, set of rules or parameters. There, there's no playbook for that. Every company is going to be different. Without having codified your culture and values, without trying to live up to those culture and, that, the culture and values every day, I think those situations are going to be almost prohibitively complicated when you, when you get into them. Because you have no true north. And so everyone is going to start projecting their own interests, personal interests, professional interests. Uh, there's going to be uh, challenges that could become crises, and then you've introduced stress and tension in a way where you're not necessarily thinking at your best. But it can be done very differently than that. So, excuse me. Why don't, he, he implicitly is asking you why you're doing business in China. So maybe you could, maybe you could. I, I, I don't know that he said it that way. No, he did. You as a he really did, reporter at Fortune would characterize <laughs> it that way. So China. So. Uh, I mentioned the 780 million professionals and students in the world. That's our immediate addressable opportunity for a mission. When you walk into my office, the first thing you'll see is our mission statement. It's right behind me on the wall. People oftentimes say, boy, uh, China, uh, how have you been able to go about that the way that you have? You guys look like you're, you're gaining some traction. It's a very challenging situation. And they said, for starters, how did you make that decision? And I said, the decision as to whether or not we should be in China that was really the easy part because it comes back to the mission. And unless we're going to add some kind of parenthetical to the mission statement to connect the world's professionals, excluding the following places, uh, we need to do everything within our power to make sure that the platform extends into one of the largest economies in the world. Then the question is, well, how are you going to do it? And if there are uh, certain situations that you're faced with that would uh, require you to compromise on your culture or your values or the way you'd be operating in a different country, how do you make those decisions? And the answer is you spend a lot of time thinking about how you're going to deal with it before it actually happens. And you stress test it to the best of your ability. And I say to the best of your ability because the theoretical exercise isn't going to come close to what happens in the real world. But at least as a team, you can come together and you can sit down and you can start to hash it out proactively and not reactively. And you can make sure you're all aligned. And you can make sure you all fully appreciate how challenging it's going to be. And for those that have not worked at companies that tried to do that in the past and ran into some very significant challenges, you can share your experiences and make sure that you're all aware of what it really entails. And so that was the approach that we took. And so we, we, there are a bunch more questions. Maybe we can get a couple extra minutes, just very briefly. So what is the policy when the Chinese government wants to censor information on LinkedIn in China, what, what, how do you react? 
So we said when we were originally entering the market, it was February of last year, we localized and simplified Chinese, and um, uh, we put up a blog post, uh, and in the blog post, we said that uh, one of the things that we're trying to accomplish uh, is connect the world's professionals, another is to create economic opportunity. China is one of the most important economies in the world, and in order to be able to operate in China at a scale that makes sense and is going to create the kind of value that we'd like to create for people both inside of China and uh, on a global basis, uh, we need to be able to do business in China. We need to get a license in China, and that requ requires complying with the way business is Understood. done in China. Understood. Uh, back there, and then we'll go over there. Go ahead. Okay, so this is a somewhat related question. Michael Cabora with Levi Strauss and Company. So we we are local. China. Yeah, we're, we're local, man. Yeah, thank so, you for hosting us. Your yes. path, our pleasure. Um, so we've dealt with the China question. This really isn't about that. It's actually related somewhat, though. I mean, what what you're trying to do, which is to link the people who want jobs with the jobs that are available, right? That is an amazing goal, and to use the market to do that would amaze my mom who worked at the California Department of Employment for years, right? So we're ha harnessing the market to do this thing. My question's related to what happens when there's market failure, right? What happens when there's exploitative recruitment schemes out there? What happens around forced labor and folks who might want to use LinkedIn for those kinds of purposes? What do you do about that? And this is really getting more specific, right? Are you concerned about that? Do you have any programs in place to deal with, with those market failures? So we do have a, a very clear terms of service. And we do have a very clear set of policies that help us govern the decision making in terms of what's permissible and what's not permissible. And again, the more codified and more proactive we can be along those lines, the better. It makes the decision making when you're in the moment that much easier. But you also have to f have the flexibility of knowing you're not going to be able to proactively think through every what you're very articulately referring to as a market failure. And uh, we learn. You know, we, we learn every day we do this. And uh, the, the hope is that as a leadership team, and then more broadly as an entire company, we're making the right decisions. And we're making the right calls. And we're putting the right governors in place and the right policies in place and the right technologies in place to not only prevent market failures, uh, but when we see a, a market failure, to help resolve it and to help fix it. And there's myriad examples of this, but that's an ongoing process. I promise this gentleman in the back. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Robert Strand. I'm with the University of California, Berkeley at the Haas School of Business. And you uh, clearly articulated a, a lofty and, and, and noble purpose for your company. And you also discussed the importance of, of shareholder wealth. And I'm interested in, is, are the shareholder interests always aligned with the purpose of your organization? And if not, what do you do to negotiate those potential tensions? Well, we're very fortunate at LinkedIn uh, to have a dual class structure with regard uh, to investors and our stock. And uh, one of the reasons for that was because we are very purpose driven and uh, we are very serious about realizing our vision and manifesting our mission. And we don't want uh, short term decision making uh, to take us off of that path. And so, you know, it's funny, when we were a privately held company, I had never been the CEO of a public company before. I'd never been a CEO before. And uh, one of our board members asked me the question, uh, what kind of public company is LinkedIn going to be? I was like, what? He's like, yeah, what? haven't you given this some thought? You know, you're private today. You're going to be public. Things are going to change. So what kind of public company do you want to be? And I was like, hmm, let me get back to you. I'm going to give that a little bit of thought. So I went off and I thought about it. Next meeting, came back. I said, I gave it a lot of thought. And we're going to be the same company as a public company that we were as a private company. The exact same. Same vision, same mission, same long-term focus, same short-term execution, same culture, same values. And he said, thank you, I appreciate that. And uh, I said, if we're not able to do that, one of two things has happened. Either we weren't ready to be a public company, or I was not the right person to lead us as a public company. 
And I was just being very open and very honest at that point. Afterwards, it's funny, uh, my general counsel and uh, CFO came over to me, being great lieutenants, they didn't say this during the meeting. They said, Psst, come here for a second. I said, huh? what? I knew, they were, I knew I was in trouble. They said, uh, <clears throat> you know that thing you said about we're gonna be the exact same company? Well, you know we can't be, right? I said, what are you talking about? And they said, well, you do that all hands every other week, where you're completely transparent, you talk about everything. I said, yeah. He said, you can't do that as a public company. I said, why not? He said, oh, there's all kinds of potential issues. And I said, no, 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 that's not the way this is going to work. We are going to operate in a way that aspires to be the company that we ultimately want to be. And we are not going to play down to the lowest common denominator of our fears. That's the fastest way to realize that. And so, <laughs> thanks. So very fortunately and very thankfully, you know, we were a much smaller company back then, but if you, are, if you are aligning your leadership around that, if you are making sure that when you're recruiting new employees, they all understand what you're about, you do give yourself a chance to operate that way. So we're, we're out of time. I just want to, I want to translate one thing that you said, make sure I'm translating it correctly to answer this question, and then I'll ask one final question that I've asked you before, Jeff, which is, first of all, you alluded at the beginning of your answer to the fact that you have a dual class share system, and I think what you were, what you were saying, but you didn't, you didn't finish saying, is that Reed Hoffman is the controlling shareholder of, of LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So you can, to some extent, you can behave like a private company because one person gets to decide yes or no. Uh, I'm sorry, one person effectively represents the shareholders. The, the key there is could and not necessarily could. do. And the goal, the ultimate goal, is that your vision, your mission, shareholder value are aligned. And very thankfully, we are in a position by virtue of our context and what we're trying to accomplish in the world where that's the case. Creating economic opportunity creates a lot of value. Jeff, just end by explaining to everybody how, why you are so confident that everything, you know, your ability to continue to keep your values, to keep your behavior, so far has happened at a time of um, only success for LinkedIn. LinkedIn has grown revenues, profits, and so on. Why are you confident you can keep your values when, if and when the inevitable happens, which is something goes wrong and you have a financial hiccup, a management hiccup, something, because that's when companies stray from their values. Because plenty has already gone wrong. And really? We, oh, yeah. Sure. And, uh, yes. Uh, there's a, a long list of examples of things that have gone wrong. But we have a team in place that has learned how to and continues to evolve and learn how to deal with those situations. And we rely on those very same things we've been talking about to get through those challenges. That's when the culture, that's when the values matter most. And with each passing situation, with each passing challenge, that we're able to traverse and navigate in a way where we can continue doing what we hope to accomplish in the world, our culture and values become that much stronger. So it's actually self-reinforcing. And it's why ultimately, had you asked me about culture and values about 10, 15 years ago, I think like a lot of people, I would have rolled my eyes at you. I may have even busted out like a Dilbert cartoon strip. And if you asked me about culture and values when I first started at LinkedIn, I would have said I have a newfound appreciation for it as a CEO and it's important to define that stuff. But you asked me about it today, I think it's one of, if not our most important, competitive advantages. Now I think a round of applause would be appropriate for Jeff Wiener.